good evening. Welcome both to our online and our in-person IAF audience. I'm Mike Leonard, and I'll be serving as your MC tonight. If you have not already done so, please silence your cell phones. Now, our spring season is really shaping up to be an exciting one, and this evening is a great example. We are very pleased to be partnering with the Economic Club of Traverse City for this evening. Thanks for the partnership. It's great. Um, and hello to friends watching uh, online from the old art building in Leland. This is something we're trying out as a new deal of having some satellites there for, you know, as you know, we cannot always uh, predict the weather around here in northern Michigan. So it's something we're trying. We're going to see how it works tonight. And if it works well and we get some good turnout there, we're going to do it some more from some other locations. Uh, Lucy is going to be taking uh, questions at the end of the presentation. If you have a question, please put it on cards provided and pass it on to one of our terrific volunteers. Now, that's what it looks like. Uh, you can remain anonymous or you can put your name on the card. If you are a student, I know the students are back there in the rear, so please pay attention. Uh, put student at the top of your card. There's a reason for that. We want to ensure that your voices and questions are heard. You are our future. If you are part of our online audience, you can send us your questions at any point in the presentation. And now, let me introduce our speaker for this evening. Lucy Hornby is a senior associate at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. She was a recent visiting scholar at Harvard's Fairbanks Center for Chinese Studies, where her research focused on the revival of the Chinese state and the rise of Xi Jinping. During the reform era, she, lived in, she also lived in China for almost 20 years, working as a journalist for Reuters and the Financial Times before returning to the United States as a 2020 fellow at the Neiman Foundation for Journalism at Harvard. She first moved to China in 1995, where she taught English in Wuhan, thanks to Princeton in Asia, a program that builds bridges between the United States and Asia. She has also reported on Asian energy markets and investment in, for Dow Jones Newswires and on Latin American energy investment for energy intelligence. Lucy is fluent in Mandarin and she has reported from every Chinese pro province and region. Uh, she's reported on topics ranging from elite politics to the trade war and environmental pollution. Her coverage was honored with the 2018 Society of Publishers in Asia Award for Excellence in Business Reporting, among other awards for investigations into the ownership and financing of some of Asia, China's largest and most opaque conglomerates. She will be joined later by our very own Stan Otto. Stan is the co-chair of the International Affairs Forum. He is a career diplomat with 40 years of expertise in promoting international cooperation and understanding, including policy planning, negotiating, and management in Europe, Asia, the Middle East, and Africa. Prior to joining the Foreign Surgeon Service, he was a Fulbright lecturer in Taiwan and taught in universities in Iran and Egypt. He speaks too many languages to list here, but has promised to stick to English for the evening. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Lucy Hornby to our International Affairs Forum stage. You're on, lady. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to thank uh, you all very much for the warm welcome. This is uh, my first time in Michigan. Um, but so far, it has been uh, very gratifying to see snow um, because I, you know, spent many, many years in Beijing and in Boston and a year ago exactly moved to Tucson, Arizona, and I really miss the winter very much. Um, so I thought I would start in that mode. I was feeling nostalgic as I uh, picked my opening slide. Um, this is a section of the Great Wall, um, and in winter, which... Uh, was 
important to me as I was sitting there in the sunshine. Um, it's also near, uh, since yesterday was Valentine's Day, I actually got engaged on a section of the Great Wall very near this one. Um, so it's a good luck section of the Great Wall. Uh, and the third reason for choosing this particular picture uh, is that this section of the Great Wall was built at a time uh, in the middle of the Ming Dynasty um, when uh, an initial explosion of growth and economic activity was starting to slow and turn and the dynasty was turning into a much more defensive, uh, stagnant uh, phase. And so since we're talking now about uh, the end of China's super cycle, the end of China's boom, uh, I thought it would be a good reminder that uh, we've been here before, or at least China has been here before. Um, and without further ado, uh, I will move to Wuhan, China, um, which perhaps you guys have heard of. So in 1995, when I said I was going to Wuhan, China to talk, teach English for a year, nobody I knew, including myself, had ever heard of Wuhan. Um, and at the time, it was better known for being the Detroit of China. Uh, now, why is it called that? Because that's where the car industry was um, centered. So they had a large number of Chinese automotive companies there. Um, the French had invested quite a lot, um, the French auto companies had invested in partnership with the Chinese. Um, the Americans had not invested in autos there. They had built a gigantic Budweiser factory while I was there. Um, which, you know, we weren't supposed to drink the water, but now we're supposed to drink the Budweiser, but it, it was good Budweiser. Um, and um, the school I was teaching in was actually training uh, students in English and French so that they could go on to work in the auto uh, industry. Um, but I include this picture just to give you an idea of how basic the conditions were. Um, these students, they were all, these were my sophomores. This guy, his name was Magic after Magic Johnson. Um, but, you know, they were considered the elite. At the time, you know, there weren't that many Chinese young people who were privileged to go to college. And yet, you know, they were living in very basic conditions. Uh, in Wuhan in the winter, the temperature goes around 40 degrees and it rains continuously. Uh, there's no heat in any of the buildings. And so you're just chilly all the time. Uh, as you can see, they're all wearing coats um, and jackets to class. Um, I don't know if you can see here, but that's actually a chair shoved into the window. Uh, one of the panes was missing, and so the kids would shove the chairs in the window to keep the rain and the wind from coming in. Uh, so pretty basic uh, living situation, but very aspirational people. Uh, they really wanted to have a better quality of life um, and a more active and powerful country. And they were willing to work very hard to get that. Um, and the second photo, to contrast, this was my apartment um, that we lived in before we left Beijing. And so you can see in, from 1995 to 2019 what an incredible transformation there was in the material circumstances of people's lives. Um, my neighbors in the, and my landlord in these apartment buildings were very similar socioeconomically to my students, um, but they were the people who had benefited from this huge boom in China. They were the people who had invested in real estate, uh, and they were the people who had done well uh, in the reform era. So you can just see what a transformation there was. Um, now here's another way to look at it. This is a graphic that I really love. It's done by a Norwegian political scientist. Uh, his name is Ruben Matheson. Um, and what he's showing is how the relative weight of different countries' GDP uh, has changed. So the US, as you can see, we've done pretty well. Uh, in 1970, we were about 31% of global weighted GDP. Went down to about 24% by 1995, and then we've been steady there ever since. Um, so we still kind of punch above our weight in terms of population. Um, the big loser, obviously, uh, was the Soviet Union, uh, which at the time accounted for about 17% of global GDP. After it bust up, um, Russia and the smaller stands and the other former republics, they don't add up together to anything what the cloud of the Soviet Union was. Japan, you can see the bubble. It went really big by 95, and now it is about the same size as it was in 1970, relatively speaking. And then, of course, the rise of China. So from here to that to boom, much bigger. Uh, but you can see that most of China's relative gains 
who's lost has been Western Europe. Uh, so that's where you've seen a huge shrink in terms of relative economic weight, much more than in the United States. Uh, fun fact, the Soviet Union up here and Japan and now were all about 17% of the relative um, GDP of the world, uh, which I don't know if that bodes well for China or not. So another quick view of how much material circumstances changed because of this long boom. Uh, these are not taken in the same place, but all these three pictures are small, smaller towns on this, as satellite towns of a very large city. Um, and pretty much across China, that's what you would have found in the 1970s, that's what you would have found in the 90s, and this is what there is today. Uh, so an, a tremendous boom. You know, here in the US, we experience it in terms of China's relative weight. Uh, China's relative presence and the imports that come in, but for Chinese citizens, it has been a tremendous acquiring of the kind of material comforts that we take for granted here in America. Um, so now, this boom is slowing, right? They've built every apartment building they could possibly build, and then um, people have all bought, if they can afford it, their first car, their first refrigerator, their first television, and their second car, their second refrigerator, their second television many apartments if they can afford it. Uh, and so demand in China has just gone from, you know, the, the kind of eight to 15% growth that you were seeing during that reform era. Uh, and it's suddenly turned the corner and become a mature economy where people buy new things for replacement, but they're not necessarily that enormous developing market. What does that mean for Chinese people? Well, as you can see by these ladies, um, it means they're well-fed and they're well-clothed. They might travel internationally. They certainly travel. Uh, they have leisure time. I'm going in and out here. I don't know why. Should I switch it? OK, yell if you can't hear me. Um, they're starting to shift their spending, right? So now uh, they're spending more on services. Uh, you can see some of these ladies obviously go to the hairdresser fairly often. Um, but also, they're spending the money on their kids' education, their grandchildren's education, elder care as they get older entertainment, but not so much goods. From the point of view of being a Chinese citizen, it's been a tremendous and very welcome transition. But Chinese businesses, of course, are extremely worried. Because as this economy slows, as it turns, and it probably already has turned, from a fast developing country co economy to a very mature economy, all these businesses were invested for a booming economy. And now they're suddenly facing a much more competitive environment and a lot of them have a lot of debt. So there's a huge amount of worry right now in the Chinese business classes. Uh, how are they gonna survive as this economy shifts? Um, here's another graphic that I liked. Um, it's from a online site called howmuch.net and they kind of, ex they do graphics to illustrate uh, various economic concepts. Um, but what you can see here, which is so obvious, is that China's manufacturing capacity is way out of proportion to its population, right? Um, it's roughly eyeballing it 20% or 40% of the world's capacity, and in many industries, it's well over half. That capacity was built, a large part of it, uh, to either service um, this growing China market or to export in some cases. But now that the growing China market is saturated, a lot of it is going to have to either have to shut down, and that involves unemployment, and it involves debt, uh, you know, basically defaults, or they're going to have to export, right? Those are the only two choices. It's the only way you can manage a capacity that's so completely out of scale to your own population. Uh, and I think that that'll pose a lot of challenges for us in our society. Um, we already saw two election cycles ago uh, where imports from China were a huge um, election um, talking point. Uh, the Trump administration obviously put up tariffs. Uh, the Biden administration has chosen to keep them. Um, but I think the challenge now is that simply putting up walls is not actually going to help us. Uh, because all of this overcapacity it doesn't have to flow to the US, right? It can also flow to all the other countries in the world. And those are countries that our companies also are using to export to. Uh, moreover, in the past eight or 10 years, uh, China, especially under Xi Jinping, uh, the current president, 
uh, they have um, diverted a lot of their uh, state investment to industries where they felt like they were still lagging the U.S. Uh, so high-tech industries, uh, the kind of industries that even as companies shifted basic manufacturing to China, uh, they tried to keep it home. Uh, so China, uh, Japan, Korea, the U.S., Taiwan, Western Germany, or Western Europe, sorry, and especially Germany, uh, are all about to find uh, that these high-end goods are going to become a new form of competition, uh, exported from China, affordable prices, good enough quality, and coming out in volume. So I think that's going to be a real challenge for us. Um, and just a very quick example on that, something that I understand is dear to your hearts, GM. Uh, in January, GM announced that their sales in China had fallen for the first time since 2009. Um, and although that technically was in a market where China was producing more uh, cars, the whole China market is increasingly dependent on exports. Um, China's domestic car demand peaked sometime around 2017. Um, and so just a quick photo here. All these cars, these are all lined up for export. Um, and they're going to go to a lot of countries where uh, the fact that China can produce these cars, especially these EVs, and do it in an affordable manner is going to be very attractive. Um, now, yesterday, I did a, or no, Monday, I did an interview with uh, WTCM here, uh, and he had a lot of great questions, but the best one was uh, a question that was, is Xi Jinping crazy? And I think the answer is absolutely not. No, he's not crazy at all. What he's doing, and whether or not you agree with what he's doing, is a rational response to the circumstances he's faced with. Um, and so what are you seeing? An economy that was growing very fast, uh, that coincided with a lot of political and social liberalization in China. But under Xi, you've seen a real repressive uh, urge, and you've seen a real shift back to the state as the main economic actor and the party as a really intrusive political presence. This is uh, welcome or not, that's how it is, but from Xi Jinping's point of view, I think it's very much a response to this slowing economy. Um, so he's founded something called the Belt and Road. Uh, this is a platform, basically, where China's hoping to export their capacity to build infrastructure uh, and their capacity to build um, heavy industry type projects around the world, that is very much a response to the overcapacity at home. They need to have these new markets, and when they expand into these new markets, they're also creating geopolitical ties, market ties, um, but that's a response to the fact that they don't want to have to shut things down and have the unrest and dissatisfaction that a recession and unemployment drives at home. Um, now, obviously, China is becoming uh, noticeably more repressive after a very loose period. Um, a lot of that, again, is because you were having uh, workers' protests. You were having protests by people, uh, common people who had lost investments. And uh, if you're in a one-party state, the thing that you hate the most is uh, dissatisfied people taking to the streets. Uh, so I think that explains a lot about his emphasis on reinstating the party and his alliance with the security services domestically. And then finally, the army, if you are running a one-party state, the thing that you need above all and no matter what is the support of the army. Um, and you can see this alliance between Xi and the military interests. He's pushing a lot of capital towards, or a lot of um, money streams towards them. Uh, inevitably, that means he's more attuned uh, to their priorities and their demands. Uh, and so under Xi, you're seeing the party apparatus, the military, and the domestic security services take a much bigger front seat as opposed to when the economy was booming during the reform era, the econ economic interests were really in the front seat. Um, so again, he's not crazy, but it definitely poses a lot of challenges to America because you're looking at um, that kind of behavior in a country that has equivalent geopolitical clout to ours. Uh, and with that, um, uh, sort of a parting thought, uh, I think that this, there, there was another question that the WTCM didn't really ask me, but I could tell was behind their questions about China um, as the boom ends and if the economy is slowing or even going into recession in some places. Um, 
there was the sense that do we then not need to worry about China, right? Did, did we win, kind of? Um, and I think no, right? Because even a slowing China is still a very large China, right? And it's a China that's going to have to deal with all these uh, stresses and, and events domestically. It's a China that absolutely needs to have these international markets uh, to take off some of the pressure of that overcapacity at home. Uh, and so therefore, it's, it's still gonna be there. It's still gonna be a rival um, and also a potential partner. Uh, so my final point is just that I don't think that we should take all the recent talk about the Chinese economy being in trouble as an excuse for the U.S. to become isolationist and not engage with China on all the different geopolitical levels where they are now present thanks to this long boom. So that's it for now. Um, I thank you very much uh, for coming and listening, and we're now going to invite um, Stan Otto up uh, for the next portion of the talk, after which is questions, and I really hope um, that there'll be some, because there's nothing worse than standing up here and hearing absolute silence. <laughs> so thank you very much. So thank you, Lucy. That was a great presentation. And thanks for being here, General. Well, thank you very much. Uh, yeah. It's always better to have someone in person, mm -hmm. and then more questions can come. <laughs> There's a lot to talk about. Um, I, first, I guess I should say, happy year of the dragon. Thank you. Um, does that mean in China there will be a lot more children? It's very lucky if you have a dragon baby, yes. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So you think there will be? Well, you got to plan ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I hear it's very linked to the fertility rate the year before. <laughs> it can be, yes. <laughs> yes. But actually, I've also seen in articles in the economists that they don't think there'll be that many this year because of the hard times. The youth are not having as many children as before. There, there's a lot more pessimism. Mm -hmm. Are all those things true? Or? Yeah, I think all those things are true. Um, China is, you know, the sort of mood is quite pessimistic. Uh, but also, uh, there's a lot of pressure on young Chinese couples if they're trying to raise a family. Uh, they also have to take care of their parents and grandparents. Uh, and so even though people are now allowed to have two children, um, there's not a, a lot of people feel that actually one is fine. <laughs> you know? really? um, and so there's, there's a sort of reluctance um, to have as many children as the government thinks they ought to be having. Sure. Yeah. And it's not... Not good to have children out of wedlock. Oh uh, no, that in China. Frowned on, that's frowned still on, yeah. really frowned off on. Mm -hmm. off the boards there. Yes. You know this demographic question is a big one, and you didn't mention too much about it, but I was reading uh, the World Bank projects. Well, they, I mean it's a fact that China has lost population in the last two years, like a million two years ago, a couple of million this year, this last year, two thousand. And the projections are that that will accelerate because the population pyramid is now upside down. And it will be more like a Grecian urn, kind of like down to a little tiny base. So they're, they're projecting actually by 2100, they will have half the people. I've seen that projection. It's kind of hard to get your head around. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, but the fact is that you had in the 1950s and 1960s, people would have families of five or six. Um, and because public health was so much better, those five or six children would all live, uh, which of course was very unusual. Historically in China, there was high infant mortality um, and, you know, the same problems the rest of the world had. So with the advent of vaccinations and better hygiene, you suddenly had these big families. Um, and it was a sort of panic at that that led them to adopt the one-child uh, policy. Um, now, what they could have done is, of course, in every other society, as the economy develops, as you move to cities, people naturally tend to choose to have fewer children. Um, and they, instead, they had this abrupt chop. Um, but now that they've loosened it again, you know, there's a whole generation of onlys out there who kind of feel like being an only child is, is the way to go. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, but it seems like that's created a, a really serious problem that's hard to re remediate. Because they have, like I said, look, the it's hard down to know. Pyramid. You know, they still are micromanaging people's children. 
right? Yeah. And so if you lifted all restrictions whatsoever, then just like here, you'd be people who chose to have none, people who choose to have one, people who choose to have two, people who choose to have four, right? So it's not clear to me that it has to be a huge population drop. Um, really? But if you have a nanny state trying to micromanage it, then probably that it is. It continues now, would I would think so, yeah. Yeah. I mean, if it does continue, then there's huge problems in the social system, in the economy, lack of workforce, all those things. Yes, and also a great burden of an aging population. Uh, so uh, I think we were talking last night that there are certainly some villages in China where you know, everybody is over 70 or over 80. Um, and so they don't necessarily want to move to the cities. Uh, the, their children can't necessarily uh, support them in little tiny basement apartments. Uh, but at the same time, you know, as they're alone, uh, their houses are d dilapidated. Uh, the nutrition is very poor. And if, God forbid, they're sick or they fall, there's just nobody there to help. Uh, so that's a real concern and worry. Uh, sure. both as on a family level and as a social level. Yeah. Okay, well, I was just going to say this is a, a bit like in Japan when I was there, mm -hmm. where anybody who was under 80 was considered young. And you go to parties, you know, with a young group <laughs> like that. But let's, let's go to one other thing that you mentioned, uh, the, the debt. And you didn't go into that in much detail. I think the la latest figures from the the World Bank are that they're up to 300% of GDP. Yeah, so um, I'll do a little plug here. Tomorrow, uh, the Economics Club is having a lunch, uh, and I'll be talking a bit more about debt and financing there. Um, but in a nutshell, um, you know, when you have great growth like this and when you have uh, huge investments, naturally you have a lot of debt, um, but it's been very difficult for um, Chinese companies to make profits because it's such a competitive um, industry, right? Every industry in China. And meanwhile, the government uh, has spent an enormous amount of money on infrastructure, uh, which has also been done using uh, debt of various descriptions. Um, so there's a lot of debt in China, and one of the big problems is to guess how much debt there is, uh, because you have... Uh, the central government debt, right? And then you have each, pro each province uh, has significant debt, which they've been using to build out their infrastructure. And then each town, right? So a city like Traverse City, you know, it's, it's difficult to know how much of that uh, should be added into the national debt and considered part of the national debt. Um, so putting a figure on it has been a real problem. And then the other problem is companies. So in the US, of course, almost all companies are private companies. If they're in debt up to their ears, that's their problem and their shareholders' problem. Uh, but in China, a lot of companies are owned by either the central government, the provincial government, or the local governments. So the question is, do you include their debt into the government debt or not? Um, so putting a finger on how much it is is hard, but there's a lot. Yeah, mm -hmm. and the, the Red Army runs their own groups. Yeah, so that's another interesting thing about China compared to here. The army is very invested in the economy. Um, so a lot of land is held by the military. Uh, the military, uh, until the mid-90s, were running all sorts of companies. Um, and even today, there are sort of military-adjacent companies that play a huge role in the economy. Uh, actually, near where I lived was the paramilitary hospital. Uh, so if you, if, you know, you had a certain sickness, you might just go to the hospital that was run by the paramilitary, uh, but the paramilitary was running it as a profit center. Uh, so that's very unusual uh, from our point of view. Sure. Yeah. Um, on the debt side, you see a lot of articles where they talk about hidden debt. Is that what you're talking about now? Yeah, so um, in China there are so many different formats in which both companies and governments, especially local governments, issued debt, that uh, it, it becomes very difficult. Um, and one of the big ones is um, because, again, in China, the land is all owned by the government. So uh, local governments, let's say in Traverse City, let's say you've had a real estate boom, 
and let's say Traverse City wants to build a new airport. So they might collateralize the value of the land, all the land around here, uh, at a very high rate in order to get the debt to build a huge airport. But then let's say it doesn't snow for three years, your tourism drops, you have this huge airport, nobody's coming, uh, and the debt is tied to the collateralized land value at a value that's much higher than what anybody would actually spend for that piece of land if the government were to auction it off. Um, and so that uh, is what they call the hidden debt, um, which is solvent on paper, but probably not in reality. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, let's switch to a, since our time is limited, okay. we'll switch to a slightly different topic. Since you're a journalist there, and you're doing great journalism, mm -hmm. I'm surprised you weren't thrown out. Because <laughs> Uh, so, I was lucky in two ways. Um, first of all, I was working for the Financial Times, which is very, very well regarded in China. Uh, they have a Chinese edition, which is well read by Chinese officials. Um, and the second thing is most of the American journalists were expelled in the context of COVID reporting and then the subsequent trade um, face-offs. Face and so, I had the good fortune to dodge a bullet there um, I left China in August of 2019 to take a fellowship at Harvard. Nobody, a few people had been expelled at that point, but not very many. Um, and then COVID hit, of course, it hit China in late December, early January. It hit the US in February, March. Uh, and the big wave of expulsions of American journalists happened that subsequent, yeah. yeah. And I, I, I would wonder, as a journalist or just as a private citizen, did you, did you notice the repression? I mean, people talk about that also. You know, difficulty not just for journal journalists, but for the Chinese themselves, the Uyghur out in the West. Um, did you see that yourself? So, uh, you know, foreigners in Beijing live a very privileged lifestyle. Uh, journalists are a bit different because we are constantly running into people who have already bumped into trouble with the state and who are looking for recourse. Uh, so I think as journalists, we tended to experience that more through the people we met um, than your average expat did. Uh, in Beijing, you didn't notice so much. If you went to another city, you often got followed, tailed. Um, we assumed our phones were tapped. Uh, occasionally, we saw evidence that our emails were tapped. Um, but you know, that sense of repression really tightened whenever you went to an uh, area with ethnic minorities. So an area that was inhabited by Tibetans, an area that was inhabited by Muslims. Uh, during the period that Xi Jinping has been in power, uh, he has um, become convinced, apparently, or the security services are convinced uh, that Muslims in general and a type of Turkish Muslim called Uyghurs in particular um, are a threat, and so there has been a tremendously repressive um, hand put on these peoples. Uh, and again, as journalists, we feel that through the people we talk to uh, more than personally. Um, although, of course, if you're being told you have to leave in a week, then you feel it personally as well. But uh, most of all, we felt that oppression through the or repression um, through the people we were trying to interview and whose stories we were trying to tell. So could you just choose people to interview? So the way censorship works, in China, if you're a Chinese journalist, you can talk to whoever you want, but then you might find that your story never gets out. Or it gets out so changed that your original reporting is just gone. That's how censorship works for Chinese. For foreign journalists, nobody is censoring what we're writing. But what they can very easily do is intimidate somebody that you want to talk to. So if you're an academic and I want to interview you, maybe I've interviewed you in the past and it was very easy, but now you tell me, look, I'm really sorry, but you can no longer come into my office to speak to me. Or I'm sorry, I can't talk to you on the phone anymore. It's just not worth it for me. Uh, so we lose those channels of information. And then for common people, um, you know, there's, there's two types. There's dissonance. Uh, who have chosen already to challenge the state one way or another for a cause they believe in. Um, these are usually very, very brave individuals. And their interaction with journalists, uh, they often view as a kind of protection. 
Um, and so they might take more risk to be affiliated with us because they want that story to get out. But your average person, you know, who runs a little kiosk or who is living their normal life and uh, something terrible happens and they want to fight it, they also often think that foreign journalists are going to be their ticket out, right? That we're going to tell their story and then somebody up there is going to read it and realize that an injustice has happened to them and it's going to be fixed. And so what you often see are these terrible situations where uh, very common people will go out of their way to try to find foreign journalists and then the local government, who's usually the one that caused the problem, uh, will go out of their way to try to stop them. Um, and you can get into some very ugly situations that way. Uh, and, and that really drives home. You know, if, if you stay in your lane, uh, you can have an e easy life without a lot of problems. But once you bump against the state in that way, then suddenly that's when the repression is really felt. Um, and that's where we see it too. Could you describe how you, uh, could you describe how you actually get permission to travel around the country? So in the old days, you had to have permission to go somewhere. Um, and of course, the best journalists ignored that. Uh, but officially, they lifted that rule in 2007. And so officially, you don't need permission to go anywhere anymore. You can go wherever you like. Uh, the only exception being Tibet, where you need a special visa. Now, as the areas have become more repressive again, uh, one thing that journalists have found is that you might fly, to, fly somewhere and you get off the plane and there's the cops waiting for you at the airport. And so it's like short visit, turn around, go back. Um, and that has really hampered reporting because of course budgets are tight and the editors don't wanna fly you somewhere if they know you'll be turned around immediately. Um, there have been terrible cases of the uh, news assistants who work with foreign journalists um, getting harassed and intimidated. Uh, usually that's not quite as effective as it is to harass and intimidate their parents. Um, so again, you know, the equivalent of if one of your sons or daughters were reporting with a foreign news agency in Washington, they wouldn't be bugged or bothered in any way, but the local police here might be knocking on your door saying, hey, what's, what's your kid doing? You know, what, what are they doing? Helping the foreigners, you know, maybe you better watch out or that might affect your pension. Uh, so that kind of familial harassment uh, can be very effective for uh, Chinese citizens who work with the foreign journalists. Um, and then lastly, you just have situations where you're talking to somebody and the thugs break in. And you know, you gotta leave because you don't wanna cause a fuss and make things worse for that person. Sure. Yeah. yeah, I see our time on this segment is, is limited. Maybe just one quick one. You were mentioning you know, US policy and things. Um, do you think that we made a rival out of a friend by our policy? I think it's hard to say. I think there's a certain dynamic that when there's a new kid in the sandbox, and especially when that new kid is just as large as the old kid, that no matter what, you're gonna have some friction. Um, I definitely think that there has been an increase in mistrust on both sides, um, but I also think that there's something of a structural um, friction that's going to happen even with the best of will. Okay, I guess I turn it over to Mike. Well, I think this mic works, so I think you can keep both of those mics. Uh, so it's the time now for our audience to get involved, and I'll tell you right now that uh, Boy, there's some tough questions for you here on the uh, online folks. Uh, I'm gonna alternate questions uh, from the auditorium and our online audience. And as we described earlier, if you have a question and it, it, see that it's written down on the card provided, get it to one of our helpers and we'll read the questions from the podium. Write your name on the card if, you're, if you wish to be identified, but you don't have to do that either. So the first question is, uh, this is uh, from our online audience. There's a concern by some people that a battery plant being built in Michigan by a Chinese-owned corporation would pose a threat to our national security. Is this a real concern? Uh, so I don't know the specifics of that plant. Um, but, you know, if something is in American territory and there were a 
the friction, hostility rose to that extent, um, you can just nationalize it, right? That's what you can do on your own territory. Uh, so in a way, I, I guess I'd be inclined to think that there's less national security threat from something that's being operated here. Now, I don't know what the specific concern is. Um, if the concern is that technology is bleeding out and back to China, you know, American companies build plants in China and the technology bleeds out because they've just trained 10,000 Chinese how to do it. Uh, so again, I kind of see less risk if it's being built here. Uh, if you're concerned that a listening post or something is being operated in the middle of a factory, you know, I, I don't know if I can evaluate whether that's more dangerous than somebody renting a house and putting a telephone, a, you know, an antenna there. Um, but overall, you know, I, I guess my, my sense overall is that sometimes when we talk about national security and especially also when we talk about industrial secrets, uh, sometimes I think that we don't really realize that the biggest threat and the biggest way that technology gets passed is when our American companies build plants somewhere else and teach all those employees exactly how to do it. Um, and so sometimes I feel like the national security debate here misses that a bit, um, although I don't know the specific que concern of the questioner. All right, well, here's one for you. Uh, is there a way to constructively deal with Xi? <laughs> I think so. Um, again, it depends. What do you want, right? What, what's your vision here, right? Or do, do we see ourselves moving in 50 years to a situation where China is very clearly the dominant power in Asia? Um, but we kind of get along otherwise. Uh, that's certainly a scenario that's very plausible, um, and it's one that uh, China apparently has kind of pitched at the US. Um, now, of course, we have allies in Asia who are not China, um, and they have interests, and they um, you know, want us backing their interests. Um, but I, I do think that we, it's not very clear to me what the US vision of ourselves is 50 years from now, right? We're clearly not gonna be the sole superpower in the entire world. Okay, so if we're not, and if we don't wanna just knee-jerk stop any threat to that, um, then, then what is that multipolar world going to look like? And I think if we had a clearer vision as Americans as to what that was supposed to look like, it would be a lot easier to find an accommodation with China around it. Okay. Well, uh, I, t I warned you that the, that one came from the old arts building in Leland, and I warned you they were going to be a tough crowd. So they've got a couple more questions here. That, uh, but I'm going to take one from the audience here. And uh, the question is, is, why is China investing so much in Africa as opposed to other markets? Because Africa is a place that needs roads and power plants and you know, dams and all the products that China has way too much of, right? So the way it worked in China, when China was growing so quickly, like every single province has at least one road construction company and maybe a number two road construction company and possibly a number three road construction company. And, you know, seven, in 1970, when every road was dirt, basically, there was an enormous room for all those companies to be building out the cotton modern roads that China has now. But now they've built them all, and they're not willing to shut down, you know, Zhejiang Road Company number three. Uh, and so Zhejiang Road Company number three, what they're going to do, they go to places that need roads, and they go to all these countries in Africa, and maybe Zhejiang Company number one goes to. Angola and Zhejiang company number two goes to Congo or, you know, whatever. Um, and they say, you know, we need an order book. We can build roads for you. Um, and there's just an enormous amount of room there to do that. Now, they've tried to do it in Western Europe, but they're not as competitive, right? Um, if there was a famous case where a Chinese company tried to build a road in, a road in Poland, um, but the Polish road building companies basically squeezed them out. 
um, in the United States, we don't have, you know, miles and miles and miles of highways that are just waiting to be built. Um, and if we did, we have a workforce that can do it. So um, a large part of the reason that there's so much Chinese investment into Africa and also the Middle East uh, is because there's a hunger there for that kind of infrastructure investment. And that's something that China can deliver cheaply. They can deliver it modularly uh, in the sense that, you know, 200 men come in, they work there for six months, they leave again and you have a power plant. Um, so, you know, that's something they can offer. And if they don't offer it, then they have to lay off all those people in China and they don't want to do that. Um, so there's kind of a, a mutual uh, need, surplus on one side, market on the other, and that really explains a part of the appeal of Africa in particular. Okay, uh, thank you. This one is another one question from uh, Leland, uh, and you described rather eloquently how the, uh, the uh, quality of life has improved in China. So you have a rising middle class having ex access to the outside world. Is, do you anticipate any chance for any type of a, either a social uprising or demand for change within uh, China itself? So I think there's a lot of demand among Chinese people to have ownership over their immediate civic life. Does that make sense? So, you know, when I went there in 1995, for instance, there was a kid who was kicked out of a university next to my university because he had tried to organize his fellow students into a soccer club. And in 1995, organizing students into a soccer club was considered so threatening uh, to the school and to the local government that he was kicked out of the university. Now, every university's got a soccer club. Um, people, as they became homeowners, uh, they had homeowner associations and they became super active in that because suddenly you have a stake in your neighborhood and especially given how many Chinese live in apartment buildings, you know, you really, really, really want to be sh make sure you're there at that committee meeting because the whole value of your investment depends on that apartment building being well maintained. Uh, and so you've seen a lot of avenues for that kind of civic participation. Uh, also churches uh, and temples have become much more active in China. Uh, mosques too, until the government viewed that as a threat and really cracked down on it. Uh, they started to view the, uh, especially the Protestant churches, which were extraordinarily active. Um, they would organize charity drives, they had all sorts of activities. Um, they would, there was even some Protestant churches that were so active that they would organize their uh, congregations to go to Israel to get baptized in the River Jordan. Um, I mean, immense amounts of both money and organization. That started to be seen as a threat, and under Xi Jinping, there's been a real crackdown on those kind of Christian churches. Um, temple associations, less so, but even so, you know, they were really getting very active in charity and that kind of thing, uh, and that started to be seen as a threat. So. I think there's a real hunger among Chinese uh, to have that kind of civic engagement. Whether that translates into the kind of electoral democracy that we have, you know, it may still be several steps before you get there. Um, but certainly, just to have that civic engagement, it was a very healthy part of Chinese life um, before she came along, and a new part, and people were really into it. Uh, and that chilling effect, and sometimes that active repression of that, is one of the ways in which his um, re-imposition of party rule has really made it felt, itself felt on everyday people's lives. Okay, thank you. I'm, you know, I'm getting a lot of questions from students. Either the audience has figured out that's the way you get your question asked, or uh, we've got a great bunch you of students have, you out have there. No verification if somebody's yeah, actually I'm a, a student. <laughs> I'm going to combine two questions: one from a student and one from online uh, that talks about student, about uh, not student debt, about the. China's residual, residential, and industrial debt. Uh, who's holding it? Uh, are they, uh, is there pressure uh, for them to recover that debt? What's going on right now? It kind of depends what the debt is. Uh, if it is, um, if it is government debt, uh, it is, I believe, predominantly held by Chinese banks and pension uh, type institutions. So in a way it's kind of a something of a closed loop there. 
Uh, if it is Chinese corporate debt, um, some of you may have seen uh, in the news a few days ago a company called Evergrande, uh, which was China's biggest property developer. Uh, they had actually issued debt overseas. Uh, they've now gone bankrupt, and so it's going to be real interesting uh, to see how the domestic creditors, uh, which are domestic banks but also domestic uh, private financing, how they stack up against uh, international creditors who would have bought their bonds. Um, a lot of Chinese companies issued bonds in the past, say, 15 years or so, um, and so those are held internationally. Um, and then finally, there's something which is a bit unusual for us, but many, many Chinese companies, especially the private ones, they tapped um, uh, basic shadow financing or private financing, so they would issue, through trust companies, uh, they would issue what were effectively unregulated CDs, and common people, uh, people with a little extra cash, would buy those CDs. Uh, but because they're totally unregulated, um, if those companies are defaulting, effectively your investment gets wiped out. Um, so a lot of the Chinese debt workout is being worked out out of normal people's pockets, uh, unfortunately. All right, thank you. Um, I'm going to take one closer to home now. Uh, Ten years ago, the IAF organized a two-day China conference, and they looked at the growing ties with China in this region. And one of the particular focuses was education. Traverse City Schools expected to host 400 Chinese high school students. MSU student, Chinese students were almost 10% of the student body. Uh, and there was a really positive view on education exchanges. What's happened with those education exchanges today, both domestically here in the US, and are they going someplace else? Uh, so, um Obviously, COVID had a huge chilling effect on anybody doing international exchanges of any description, right? Um, there's, I, I don't know for the high school exchanges so much, uh, but certainly for colleges, um, I think we can expect that the economic slowdown is going to hit uh, the number of Chinese families who are willing to pay full freight for their kid to go to college in America. Um, and that's going to be a real challenge for a lot of American colleges who've been relying on those international students uh, to pad out their budgets. Um, the other factor that I think Americans maybe don't appreciate so much is that, you know, in the 80s, if you could get abroad in any way, shape, or form, and even into the 90s, and even into the 2000s, and you could come back to China with a degree from overseas, uh, that was considered a real leg up career-wise. Uh, but that's much less true now. Um, why is it less true? Well, a lot of the multinationals have localized to such a degree uh, that English and um, American business practices are no longer as valuable as uh, experience working within the China market. Um, you also have the general deterioration of relationships, uh, relations between China and uh, the U.S. in particular, uh, and you also have within China just this, this perception that some of these kids are not coming back with the skills they need to make a good uh, career choice. Um, so I think that there, even if it hadn't been for COVID and even if it hadn't been for the slowdown, uh, we might have seen a reduction in the number of kids who are interested in coming here, and that would have been a real challenge for universities here who have come to count on uh, Chinese dollars. Thank you, Lucy. This is, I'm going to combine two more questions, both from students, and they're on uh, women's issues in China. Um, and uh, it, I, I'm going to try to combine that with the issue of, that Stan talked about a little bit, with uh, the fact that uh, there may be a gender imbalance as well, as a, in addition to a population or a demographic inversion. So can you talk a little bit about women's rights in China? I saw the picture you put up of the, uh, all the leadership in China. They sure looked like a bunch of old Chinese guys. Uh, so talk to me a little bit about, talk to us a little bit about uh, what you, you saw there. Yeah, so certainly the Communist Party is absolutely 100% dominated by men and even much more so than it was during the a revolutionary generation. Uh, so in terms of the leadership, it's, it's gone more male. Um, 
In terms of business uh, and corporations, uh, the Chinese state sector tends to promote men more, uh, but Chinese private businesses, uh, especially depending on which sector, uh, gave a lot of opportunity for women, uh, and women are very active, especially in real estate investing in China. Um, so as economic actors, uh, women in China are much more important than you might think when you look at the political cast. Um, and there was a lot of liberation of social mores um, along with the reform period. So divorce became more acceptable, um, gay uh, lifestyle became more acceptable for people who you know, wanted to live together or be open about being gay. All of that became much more acceptable as so society in general liberalized. Uh, but now with this uh, more politically repressive turn that it's taking under Xi, uh, there's also a lot, of, a lot of messaging coming out about traditional roles for women and how really we gotta think more about being mothers and wives now. And uh, so, so you're also seeing uh, a lot of messaging, uh, especially being directed towards young women uh, that is prioritizing marriage, prioritizing children, uh, as opposed to, again, during the reform era, the message was very much, you know, go out and get them, education, work, investment. Um, and so a lot of Chinese feminists find this to be very disturbing. And then the other uh, thing, which is really crazy, is that uh, feminist activism is really viewed as a political threat by the Chinese police. Uh, and so uh, one famous example, there were five women who planned to have a, um, a protest about women getting groped on the Shanghai subway. And as you can imagine, with a very crowded subway, getting groped is a real problem for Chinese women going to work, but it's also a completely apolitical problem, right? It has nothing to do with your political system. You can get groped anywhere in the world. Anyway, these women wanted to have a awareness-raising protest about getting groped in the Shanghai subway, and they were arrested for over two weeks, and it wasn't until there was an international outcry that they were let go. Um, and so I think that that kind of shows that when you have a turn towards political repression, what ends up happening is that security forces see everything as a threat, right? And so the, when you have a turn towards a more closed political um, atmosphere, then people who are pushing for things that are not political at all uh, end up getting seen as a threat to the state. You definitely see that um, very unfortunate transition happening within China these days. But you also have a lot of educated women who don't like it and are fighting back against it. Okay, thank you. I'm going to, we're going to have two more questions here and then we're going to wrap it up. But these are really, it says, what will happen with Taiwan? And I th it says Shanghai, but I think they really mean Hong Kong. But maybe I don't know something about Shanghai too. So uh, we'll just throw all three of those in. But uh, I think they meant Taiwan and uh, Hong Kong. Okay. So in Hong Kong, um, you know, China took over formal ownership from the British in 1997. Uh, there was supposed to be a 50-year transition uh, to full rule and control by mainland China, um, but uh, that has accelerated significantly, and it's very, very clear uh, that the mainland uh, political elite has taken over Hong Kong, uh, and they want it to be uh, very much like mainland China on a much shorter time scale. Uh, and there's been a lot of resistance to that by the local Hong Kongese. Uh, they have a very strong nativist culture there. They speak a different dialect, Cantonese, which is spoken in southern China, but not in northern China. Uh, and so there was a lot of unrest and protests about that. Uh, and since then, there's become a lot of uh, more overt repression uh, in a way that uh, mainland Chinese citizens are quite used to, but Hong Kongese are not. Um, and, and also, simultaneously, a lot of effort to uh, have what they call patriotic education in the schools and just kind of impose that view, which is totally common in mainland China, but which uh, in Hong Kong society, they'd really seen themselves as, as really a separate little society right there. Um, so that's Hong Kong. Um, 
I think it's been really heartbreaking for people who are from Hong Kong to see. Uh, I do not think it will trigger any sort of international conflict. Um, on the other hand, you have Taiwan, and Taiwan obviously is an island. Um, it is off mainland China, and it has not been ruled by mainland China. Um, and there's th this obsession. Here we go. There's this obsession that China must rule Taiwan. Um, and I think it's hard for us, it's, it's almost a religion, right? And it is widely held. It is held uh, across the board, across social classes. Um, and I think it's hard for Americans to realize how absolute the conviction is within China that they must control Taiwan. Now, in Taiwan, of course, people feel like they're doing just fine. Uh, many people do not see the need to be uh, ruled by mainland China. I was there this summer. Uh, people feel that as a democracy, as a society, Taiwan has really come into its own. Uh, they really celebrate their local roots. They celebrate their local dialects. Uh, they like ruling themselves. Uh, and there's a lot of resistance uh, to any possibility of being um, taken over by China. Uh, on the other hand, there's also a lot of fear. And people look at the video loops from Ukraine and they say, gosh, you know, we don't want to end up like that. And so if push comes to shove, what do we do? Uh, there's a huge amount of anxiety and fear there. And then, of course, in Washington, Taiwan is kind of seen as a front line in the US, any potential US-China conflict. Um, but I think from Taiwan's point of view, they feel like maybe people in Washington are a bit quicker to say that you could go over war, go to a war over them, which in Taiwan, nobody wants that war uh, because it would be on their heads. Uh, so there's a lot of anxiety. Um, on the other hand, Taiwan has a 70-year track record of somehow threading that needle, of staying independent without provoking a conflict. Um, and I think they like to think that if they were left alone, they could continue in that way. Uh, the question is, within China, there's a lot of domestic pressure uh, coming from the military, coming from the public, uh, for Xi to do something about Taiwan and take it over. So it really is a very tense flashpoint. Um, it's not easy to see the solution to, to be honest. Well, thank you, Lucy. This is the last question and an opportunity for you to unburden your soul. This is from, I'll identify the student, Bridget, asks, as a journalist, what was the most important, impactful moment or interview of your career, and how did that change your reporting or your life? Uh, okay, so there's a lot of choices here, I think. Um, one is I, uh, you know, one nice thing about being a reporter in China is you're really not a war reporter for the most part. You're not faced with that kind of disaster and heartbreak on a regular basis. Um, but there was this earthquake in Sichuan in uh, 2008 where 80,000 people died, uh, which is an enormous number, obviously. Uh, and so reporting on that uh, was really very difficult. You know, um, I think that you know, when you look at the news and you see all these images on the news, on the TV, you know, you, you don't realize that filming that is really hard. Um, or being there, speaking to these people. Because they're people like you and me, only suddenly their kids are dead and their house is destroyed. Um, and uh, so that was really hard for me. Um, I can't say I made a personal impact there, though, because, uh, of course, all the journalists were there. Um, in terms of personal impact, I would answer two. Uh, one is actually the reporting on these indebted conglomerates. Uh, I'm proud to say the FT was really front of the line on a lot of that reporting. And, um, you know, of course, internationally, people want to see what happens when a giant conglomerate uh, falls apart. But for me, the interesting and important part was you know, simultaneously, they had also issued, a lot of these private conglomerates had issued these unregulated CDs. And so being able to highlight that common Chinese people were being hurt by these companies collapsing, that it wasn't just banks losing money, it wasn't just the government losing money, you know, it was people who were losing um, 
the deposit on their wedding. It was people who were going to have to put off their kid going to college. Um, it was people, I, I knew this one woman, uh, I said to her, you know, did you, your family lose anything to these unregulated wealth products? And she goes, yeah, my husband bought some and lost, and she gave me the amount, and it was two years of her salary, working full time. And I said, what did you do? And she goes, well, nothing. You know, I could choose to be mad at him, or I could choose to maintain my marriage, and so I chose my marriage. The money was gone. Um, so, you know, I think that uh, that was something that a lot of the other foreign reporters weren't necessarily as focused on, uh, but I thought it was a really important element. Uh, and finally, one small anecdote. Uh, I went once to the Chinese countryside and did a report on a young girl. She was about 14. Um, a very lonely girl. She had just moved from the city. She had been forced to move, basically, back to the countryside. Um, lovely family, very lonely girl. Uh, and she's now 18, and we're still in touch. Um, and so that's really been gratifying for me uh, to see that she's grown up, she's found friends, um, and that we still have this channel of communication, even though, you know, we met that one time. Um, so I guess that, that would be my answer. Thanks, Lucy. That was a terrific story. And before we thank Lucy and Stan for a terrific presentation, I'm going to quickly remind you of some upcoming events. So many of you have asked for a program on artificial intelligence, so we're going we're gonna to deliver. On March 19th, we're going to welcome John Meltzer, who will speak on AI and global cooperation. Josh is a senior fellow in the Global Economy and Development Program at the Brookings Institution. On the 17th of April, IAF board member Lindsay Haskins' documentary of the Great Lakes will be shown here in Traverse City. This is the story of the destruction of the fishing industry in our Great Lakes due to the sea lamprey and the recovery of the fishery through science and international cooperation. The documentary won first in the Barcelona Film Festival and is getting a lot of buzz all over the world. Lindsay and several of the scientists who worked on the project will be here. And this is a kid-friendly event, uh, and it's free. And it'll start at 6 p.m. We're still sorting out the venue. The following evening, on the 18th of April, we have renowned author Peter Annan, director of the Mary Griggs Burke Center for, for Freshwater Innovation. Peter is the author of The Great Lakes Water Wars. Then on May 16th, Dr. Matt Fletcher will speak on indigenous sovereignty. Matt is a professor of law at the University of Michigan and a recognized expert on the subject. He is a member of our Grand Traverse uh, Band of Ottawa and Chippewa Indians. And we are also working on that one to bring in a surprise speaker, but I can't announce the identity of that person yet. So both in April and May events are brought to us courtesy of a grant from the Grand Traverse Band of Ottawa and Chippewa Indians. We're going to wrap up our uh, season uh, on the 12th of June with uh, Jennifer uh, Scoba. Uh, she is a political uh, demographer and TED speaker. She's the author of Eight Billion and Counting, How Sex, Death, and Migration Shape Our World. And if one of those subjects doesn't get you excited, I don't know what will. <laughs> So our purpose here is to educate in a forum. So please, thanks to each of our IAF members. If you aren't a member, please join. And it's your participation that allows us to bring world-class speakers like Lucy to the NMC stage. So now, please join me in thanking Lucy and Stan for a terrific and educational program. Well, thank you for having me. Okay, and, and until next time, be well, be safe, and go forth and do great things. Thank you.